Good evening and welcome to this special election 2016 post-presidential debate edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight, a recap and analysis of the first presidential debate, which was broadcast here live on Arizona PBS. Among the many issues that were discussed tonight, uh, the economy and how best to grow and protect American jobs. Here now to give us their insight on what was said and what we heard, Dennis Hoffman joins us from the Seidman Institute at ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business and Jim Rounds, an economist with Rounds Consulting Group. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining it's us. Great to be here, Ted. Lots of stuff to talk about here. Let's, let's, let's begin with overall impressions. They got to the economy right out of the gate, got to other things later, but job growth, manufacturing, the whole nine yards. What did you hear? Well, um... You know, the debate forum does not lend itself very well to, uh, y you know, the, the careful analysis of situations. So there was a, a reference to Michigan and Ohio, and, and things like NAFTA have been horrible for Michigan and Ohio. I think Secretary Clinton has, has, would certainly agree that uh, the job situation in the Rust Belt has been uh, challenging. But, of course, Mr. Trump has been a champion of this line. And so the question really is deep down, are the problems rooted in tax policy? Are the problems rooted in trade policy? Uh, what's at the root of these challenges? And, you know, there I don't think we, we really discovered an answer. Uh, Mr. Trump's answer is it's all trade. But that ignores the, the simple fact that, you know, when I left Michigan in the 70s, uh, four people were working to produce X cars, now one person, not four, one person can produce the same number of cars. It's automation and robotics that's at the root of the job loss. As an economist in Arizona, what did you hear tonight and how does it apply to us? Well, I heard a lot of, I am going to fix this. And there's this thing called the economy that's many trillions of dollars in size and there's only so much you can fix. You have a business cycle. And so the thing that was a little disappointing for me, not, not just looking at the numbers behind what they were talking about, because you got to do that a little bit too. And, and, and Dennis is right. You have a political message, and then you have your economic message, and you have to do things differently. But in Arizona, when we talk about economic development, we talk about balancing the budget and things like that. Now, we don't have to do that at the national level, even though we'd like to. It's different, different rules. But when we talk about the scale of what Trump was talking about in terms of trillions of dollars in tax cuts, now, that's fine, but when you talk about what kind of return you get on that investment, that takes a long time to, to be realized. And th we're not at the, the point in the business cycle where we can afford that. And then we're also talking about, on Clinton's side, the additional spending related to economics. And I don't know if we can necessarily afford that at this point in the business cycle, too. I feel like they both have good ideas, but it's the scale of the ideas that's really off. Now, Dennis, um, again, Trade was big at the start of this debate. Uh, Trump, I believe at one time, uh, mentioned to uh, Mrs. Clinton, uh, your husband signed NAFTA. It's the worst deal ever signed in the history of this country. Is he right? Wow. I know, based on what? Um, you know, based on the, that Mr. Trump said it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a statement clearly made in the heat of a political debate designed to elicit emotion on the on the part of folks that believe that they lost their jobs, uh, you know, because of NAFTA. It remi reminds me of the giant sucking sound from the early 90s. And the, the, the worry that I have um, is around how do we, you know, how do we advance? How do we get better paying jobs? How do we create incentives in this nation for people to acquire the skills to work? How do we create incentives in this nation for businesses to hire those folks? And I think pointing the, fixture, uh, pointing the, the finger at a particular trade deal in, you know, in this political realm that we're in and during a campaign, I, it's, I just find it worrying. Again, as an Arizona economist, you hear that NAFTA is one of, one of if not the worst trade deals ever signed by this country. You say... Well, they're trying to 
they're trying to be extreme in terms of what they're talking about. If you look at it, you have to get into the details. And I feel like his messaging on international trade would pull the economy back. It's not going to be advancing it based on what he said. But then you look at other things. So it's, and again, it's not just the one issue. You talk about the corporate income tax. Uh, very high right now. They want to bring it down to a certain rate. I don't know if they can afford that rate. So it's kind of a matter of it's a, each of these are a good idea, but it's a matter of scale. On a lot of the trade issues, I'm having a real hard time finding a this is a good idea because of scale. I think that it could cause more economic harm, and I think that's being underappreciated. I, I, people don't understand the consequences, the benefits of international trade, and the costs of engaging in a trade war. And uh, th those are going to fall on us. That's really not about individual jobs at an individual company so much as it is as about how much we're going to pay for things. All right, I want to continue this conversation in a second, but uh, we want to go now live uh, to Hofstra University, site of the debate. Uh, John Yang, he joins us there. Uh, he was there for the whole thing, saw the whole thing, uh, lived to tell about the whole thing. At least I hope you do. John, give us, <laughs> give us, a, an, give us an idea. What was the atmosphere like there? Well, I tell you, I, I was not in the hall itself. Like most Americans, I watched it on television uh, in, a, uh, in a filing center, a press filing center. I think that there's a lot, it's gonna be interesting to see what the polling is, to see what people in their homes watched, who watched it on TV uh, took away from this. Were Donald Trump's um, interruptions, were his, uh, his uh, interjections uh, to uh, Hillary Clinton, was that seen as uh, powerful and strong or was it uh, obnoxious and hectoring? Uh, I thought that uh, he, uh, he started off strong, I thought, I thought his uh, the section on trade, you, you were talking about that uh, a little bit uh, uh, before uh, you came to me, uh, it was probably one of the strongest uh, parts of his night. I thought that he was, uh, he was in command uh, during that section, and I thought that uh, Hillary Clinton looked a little uh, off balance as she tried to explain her change of position on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Uh, but I thought that he seemed to uh, uh, lose his balance, if you will, as the night went on. He, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious to know whether the Clinton people uh, decided as a tactic that they were going to question his business practices, because that's what they did, and that set him off to defend them. Uh, but I think it's going to be interesting to see what kind of uh, uh, polls we see, what the American people think of this uh, as the days go on. And John, uh, here in Arizona, our two senators are not the biggest fans of Donald Trump. Uh, Senator McCain says he will support the Republican candidate, happens to be Donald Trump. Uh, Senator Flake just says he's not going to vote for Donald Trump. I mean, th those, our two senators are not big fans. Did Trump do anything tonight to win over those kinds of skeptics and other skeptics, especially on the Republican side? I thought, you know, it was interesting. I thought that at the beginning, I thought he was going to try to. I thought that he was, uh, seemed a little calmer, uh, pointed out areas where he agreed with uh, Secretary Clinton. And I thought there was one interesting moment when he addressed uh, Mrs. Clinton as Secretary Clinton and then asked, is that all right? Is that all right? He wanted to make sure, he says, you know, I want to make sure you're happy with that because it's important to me. Uh, it's as if his handlers had told him, the campaign had told him, that he shouldn't be strident, that he should not look as if he was, uh, he had to, to be uh, careful with his demeanor. Uh, but I thought as the night went on, as I said, he, he seemed to lose it a little bit. And I also thought it was very interesting how Secretary Clinton repeatedly referred to him as Donald, uh, sort of uh, uh, not, not demeaning him, but sort of uh, uh, not giving him, he doesn't, he, well, he doesn't have a title as, as she does, of Secretary of State, former Secretary of State. I also thought it was interesting how she would let him finish. She would let him sort of carry on, as it were, rather than interrupting him. I know that uh, talking to aides, that was a point that they worked on. They tried it a couple ways in their debate prep, in the mock debates. They tried with her interrupting him to, uh, to counter uh, points. And they also tried it with her letting him finish and then taking him on. And I thought that was a, actually a pretty effective technique tonight. So in general, uh, Mrs. Clinton, who was she speaking to and did she get that across? Mr. Trump, who was he speaking to and did he get his message across? 
I thought it was interesting that Secretary Clinton did not go after him uh, in the way that she has in the past in her speeches. She did not go after him on, uh, for instance, the question about racial healing in the nation. She did not go after him on his comments. She, she offered a positive agenda of her own. I think she really was trying to give the American people a positive reason to vote for her rather than a negative reason to vote against Donald Trump. Donald Trump, as I say, I thought felt, I felt was beginning in the, in, the, in the early stages of the debate, trying to talk to people who maybe uh, have uh, concerns or doubts about him. But toward the end, uh, I thought that he fell, in a way, fell into the, the Donald Trump that we've seen in the, in the, uh, in the campaign uh, so far, in the campaign before he really sort of got to be disciplined. Uh, and I don't know that he made much progress or much headway in trying to uh, reach out to undecideds or people who may have had doubts about him. The one message that I thought was clear in what Donald Trump did tonight was that he was painting Hillary Clinton as a, as a politician. The same old politicians, the same old, uh, uh, no, you know, all talk, no action. Uh, the, uh, the line at the end I thought was a very effective one. Uh, you've got a lot of experience, but it's the wrong experience. And that's the message that's been at the core of his candidacy from the beginning. And in the Donald Trump supporters I talk to at rallies, that is, uh, in a lot of ways, the basis of the support. They want someone who's not a politician who's going to go in and shake things up. Okay, John, before you go, last question here. You've been in the media room, you're out there, you're on site, you're hearing the buzz, you're hearing people talking. Your sense, who won? I think that it's, I think it's, um, it's hard to say in these things. I think that, uh, that in a lot of ways, each side accomplished uh, what they set out to do. I think Hillary Clinton did offer a positive rationale for her candidacy. I thought Donald Trump did underscore uh, what his main point that she is a, a politician uh, who has, in his view, failed America. I don't know if his demeanor uh, succeeded in coming across. I think that's a very subjective view, a subjective thing that the voters are going to have to decide, and we have to see what the polls say in the coming days. All right, John, John Yang from the PBS News Hour. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Good to be with you. Uh, gentlemen, I, I, again, uh, it was so interesting because we wanted to talk about the economy. We wanted to talk about trade, manufacturing, the whole nine yards here. I mean, right out of the gate, there they go. They're talking about the economy, job creation, and those sorts of things. Uh, again, from an Arizona perspective, are, 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 are we hearing what we need to hear from these people? Well, again, this is politics. What, what I'd like to hear, you know, in my mind, we have serious challenges going forward. We have uh, legacy debt issues. We have uh, my generation that are going to be filled with demands for public services, and we've paid very little so far uh, toward those public services, uh, even though we had 40 clear years to, to plan for this. So I'd like to hear the hard choices that we confront and how we're going to, you know, both take our medicine and compromise. But there's no room for that in politics these days. There can be no downside to your candidacy. This is why we don't hear much about tax increases. Mrs. Clinton, yes, wants to raise taxes, but only on those nasty wealthy people, right? Mr. Trump wants to cut taxes. Uh, on everybody. Nobody seems to want to pay for all the benefits that they talk about. Um, th you know, these are challenges. And, and I think we need, you know, we, we just need compromise around these challenges. We need good, honest debate around them. And I, and I just think that's missing. And it was missing tonight, but uh, it was no surprise, really. At one point, uh, Clinton mentioned trickle-down economics and said trickle-down did not work. It's clear we all know that. Do you agree with that? Well, it's not clear, but it, it depends on the type of cut. Some tax cuts will have a bigger impact than others. It really, it, it's the same thing with the state. You got to figure out how you become competitive. And, and I feel like they, they, before things went off the rails and it got more into the insults and they were both calm that first maybe 10 minutes, 
and they were talking about the economic issues, I felt like I was waiting for them to get into the details and maybe criticize each other's plan because there's a lot of details about each other's plan. That's typically not how you go that first debate. I think maybe they will start getting into at least, not into the weeds, but they'll start looking at some of the finer points, maybe the next one or two. And I think that Clinton is gonna be attacking the scale of the cuts that, that uh, Trump wants to do. And I think Trump will be attacking, do we really wanna be spending more? Cause he was talking about the market bubble and other things like that. And so I, I think we'll hear a little bit more maybe in the next couple of months. So on, on the tax issue, and I, I think it's interesting, Mr. Trump supporters are going to tout that if we cut individual income tax rates and business rates, which is probably a more effective argument, we'll grow the economy. If I come back to the individual income tax rates, uh, you know, Mr. Kennedy cut them in 1960 or pro was a proponent of the cuts, they were enacted. We took the top marginal tax rate in 1960 was 91%. We took it to 70. Mr. Reagan came in, it was 70. By the time he left, it was 28. Those are pretty significant marginal tax rate cuts. They're going to incent people to work. Uh, they're going to be growth enhancing. I think the supply side story really works. The question is, if you're making small changes in the 30s, which is uh, invariably what we're doing now, can you expect to have massive impacts from this individual income tax cut? That's real, the question. Real quickly, we, we're simply out of time, but I want a, a yes, maybe one more word, answer, yes or no answer here. Um, uh, Trump at one point said we're in the, we have the worst revival in American history. We're in the middle of a big, fat, ugly bubble. Uh, we, don't want, we don't like bubbles here in Arizona. Are we in the middle of a big, fat, ugly bubble? It's not a bubble. All right, Dennis, are we in the middle of a big, fat, ugly bubble? No, we're not. It's a challenging economy. We cannot grow like we did in the 70s and 80s. The, the demographics are out of line, and we're not going to get a big cut in energy prices. They're already here. All right, gentlemen, good discussion. Good, good to have to you both you. here. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thanks. Social media is playing an increasing role in this year's presidential race and politics in general. And social media was certainly a buzz on a variety of platforms before, during, and after tonight's debate. Joining us now is Kendra Smith, a policy analyst with ASU's Morrison Institute for Public Policy, and Jessica Pucci, an ethics and excellence professor at practice at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Um, what role did social media play tonight? Social media had a huge role tonight in, in the debates. Leading up to the debate, it was almost kind of like Super Bowl um, and people discussing it and it being a trending topic for most of the day. So it played a huge role. Uh, you mentioned leading up to it. Did, did, did it change before, during, and after? I would say so. I think that people were preparing uh, for what they thought they were going to hear, um, and then moving on into the into the debate. I think that people were giving their first reactions to what they were hearing, so it was very much um, seeing and hearing in real time. Uh, Jessica, the, the real time conversation. What did you see out there? You know, it was really fascinating because I watched the debates through a social media lens and particularly uh, the lens of social media users in Arizona. And what I saw was, it, it actually made me think of the, the JFK-Nixon debate in which so much focus was, was placed on the appearance and the on-camera personality of the candidates. And I saw that same thing in, in Arizona users' social media today. Um, we saw not so much chatter about the issues, but a lot of talk about 
um, how the how the candidates looked. Um, it was very interesting to a lot of people that Hillary was wearing red and Trump was in a blue tie. Um, we also saw a lot of chatter about their body language, um, Trump's interruptions and, and how that was handled by Hillary. And so we saw a lot of behavioral commentary and not so much commentary on the issues. Is that, uh, that almost sounds a little superficial there. Is, are you surprised that there wasn't more substantive talk during, uh, or is social media set up, you can only say so much on a certain uh, platform for that kind of quick hit and move? No, I don't think it's odd at all. I think that these superficial comments are what people are thinking. And, um, and it's what grabs people's attention. And just like in the media, we're not hearing a lot of substantive issues about the, um, about the presidential election, but we're hearing a lot of small things, just like the comments that people make on Twitter, very small things that grab people's attention. Yeah, and, and as far as some of the tweets out there, I think we have a couple that we're gonna take a look at here. Um, Trump is not making eye contact bad communication. I mean, that's, that's, it's interesting that of everything said, someone felt the need to tweet that. Absolutely. People were tweeting about, uh, again, Trump's body language, um, how nervous the candidates appeared to be. Another Arizona user, I think we may have um, their tweet as well, remarked about Hillary's non-reactionary face. Um, in other words, Hillary's ability to keep <laughs> her cool under Trump's pressure uh, yeah. on the podium. We also saw uh, as I mentioned before, some commentary on Trump's interruptions, and not only Trump's interruptions of uh, Clinton, but his interruptions of our moderator, Lester Holt. So that was, that was some pretty fascinating conversation. People were sometimes bothered by it and sometimes cheering him on. You know, a couple of times Hillary Clinton mentioned uh, fact checkers. I hope you're working right now. I hope you're out there. I mean, she mentioned that numerous yes. times. You don't, you don't usually hear that in debates, but in this day and age, you did. You definitely, I think after the, the whole commander in chief form with Matt Lauer, I think that people were upset because of the, the lack of balance and the lack of fairness um, in the approach to this type of debate or to the forum. And so people want more balance and they want people, they want their candidates to be able to talk about things and to discuss things factually. And I think that is why that is a popular topic this presidential election. Interesting. As far as the discussions online uh, during the debate, uh, the tweets, the whole nine yards, were they civil in nature for the most part? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> depends on whose accounts you're looking at. Um, you know, it was interesting. We, we saw the, de the, the kind of online debate commentary certainly more emotional in social media, but I was also tracking the conversation in terms of organic search. So people's search queries in Google specifically, and again, more specifically, Arizonans' Google searches. And I think we have a, a graph to show here. Uh, but what I noticed is that um, the search trends and indicating searchers' interest in the debate topic represented by that green line actually peaked right as the debate was starting. Interest in the debate itself waned as the debate went on, which is so fascinating. You see a big, uh, a big spike in that yellow line, that's uh, Hillary Clinton. So right as she was, it was almost timed perfectly to when she got that first laugh out of the crowd, and she did get the first laugh. Uh, when she got that first laugh, people started searching more for uh, Hillary Clinton. The red line represents Trump, and then our moderator, Lester Holt, <laughs> is represented by the blue line. And, the and again, you're talking about people just basically Googling these names, Googling what they're saying? Or? Yes, Googling these people in general. You know, it's interesting because we may tend to, to be more careful about what we put in social media, but we will almost never lie to a search engine. So when we're using, when we're evaluating search behavior, uh, you know, we yeah. can get some real honest looks looks at, at what people are curious about, if they have questions about the candidates. Funny enough, um, the most popular question about Lester Holt was, who is he married to? <laughs> oh, for goodness sakes. So yes. So again, not a lot of chatter right. on the issues. The, the, but, pre the pressing but. issues, they have to be addressed. <laughs> uh, did, did, you, did you get the impression that people were changing their minds? No. Does that surprise you? No. I think that the dis there are very little discussions of substantive issues. I think it's more more of just to to spectate and see what's happening and to make these, as I said, these real time um, commentaries about what they're seeing because a lot of people have their minds made up about certain issues. Yeah, there's a little disappointing though that people are worried about whether Lester Holt is married. <laughs> No, I don't think it's disappointing. I think it's a human nature thing, but I also think that it is a part of this larger media 
thing, okay, that places importance on things of that nature. So um, we, the public, are just giving what we're getting as well. All right. We have to stop it right there. Good information. Thank you so much for joining us. Very interesting to see what people were talking about when the other people were talking. Uh, that's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for watching our election 2016 post-presidential debate coverage. You're invited to join us after each presidential and vice presidential debate for full analysis from an Arizona perspective. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.